Uh, this uh, part of the program is the frontier of commercial space flight. So uh, we heard uh, Robert Lightfoot this morning talking about the importance of the commercial industry in, uh, in this endeavor because more and more now we have commercial companies involved. We also heard that uh, from the program manager, the ISS, talking about how they rely on the commercial sector. So this is now a very, very important part of our program. And commercial flight is emerging here in Texas. We have two commercial launch sites in Texas. We have two space ports designated by the FAA. So this industry brings private and public partners together in new ways and uh, really important for Texas and for the country. So we're gonna hear from some of the leaders in the commercial space about what's happening in the field and also perhaps uh, what's relevant right here in Texas. So we have a terrific uh, session and uh, we will have about a 15 minute talk or so by each of the speakers. And again, a short time for questions. So uh, feel free, um, you know, get your questions while they're speaking. So our first speaker is uh, David Alexander and he is the director of the Rice Space Institute and a professor at Rice University. How about a round of applause for David Alexander. David? So uh, thank you, it's a great pleasure to be here. I'd like to thank Bonnie for inviting me. Um, uh, of, of the panelists, I'm the only one who's not actually working in commercial space, I just talk about it. So um, what, you're, what you're gonna hear after this talk is some of the details and some of the people from some of the people at the frontier of this kind of transition in the space industry. Uh, what I'd like to do a little bit, I've, I've called my presentation Off the Earth, For the Earth, and On the Earth, which is, for those of you in the know, is a kind of paraphrase of uh, a NASA uh, phrase where they, when they're talking about the ISS. And I want to kind of, instead of giving you a 50,000 foot level, I kind of want to give you a 50 billion foot level. Um, and for those of you who are doing the calculation in your head, that's about 40 times the distance to the moon and about 20% of the distance to Mars. And the idea is just to look back and, and uh, towards the system that we're, we're developing and have a, a kind of idea of, of um, what's happening. And in particular, I'm going to focus on not what's going on currently, we're going to hear about some of that from, from the other speakers, but where the conversation is going. And I think if I can work this, um, what I'd like to do here in the off the, in the, off the earth uh, component, that first bullet essentially uh, encapsulates everything that's being done right now. So I'm not really going to emphasize that. Um, I'm not also, I, neither am I going to talk about the commercial viability of some of the ideas I'll mention. It's just this exciting discussion that's going on that's being facilitated by some of the things we'll hear about uh, uh, following, following this presentation. Um, but the in-space infrastructure and space commerce is a sort of where we are just now. Almost everything in space with the space station, the stuff we heard about today, the technology that's being developed, the commercial applications of those technologies, the transportation <coughs> technologies, which is uh, the kind of commercial crew, commercial cargo, uh, and beyond, that's all sort of encapsulated in that one, in one bullet. But in, in 15 minutes, uh, it's very hard to go into all of that. Um, What's happening in terms of the discussion is to think about how commercial companies can really engage in a different way from the way they've been doing in the last 40 years um, and how we get to that point where it becomes a commercially viable uh, infrastructure, ecosystem, pick your favorite, favorite word. Um, so there's three areas and you can, you can argue with how these are, are distributed and, and things I've left out, but um, there's a resource development idea which many of you may have heard of uh, space mining, whether it's mining asteroids or whether it's mining water on the moon and so on. And uh, there's this thing for, again, NASA likes acronyms, I'll come back to one at the end, but uh, ISRU, for those of you who don't know, is uh, in situ resource utilization, which means use what's there rather than taking it with you. And that's a big focus of what the Johnson Space Center does in thinking about Mars and now as they transition to thinking again about the moon. In the community, there's a discussion of making that not in situ resource utilization, but in space resource utilization. And the concept there is you're, you're developing it in space and you're using it in space, but not in situ, but in some other location. You mine water on the moon, you bring it back to low earth orbit and you refuel satellites once you've turned the water into uh, hydrogen and oxygen and so on. Um, 
once you can mine these resources, there's different things you can do with it. You can sell it to NASA, <laughs> so they can use it for propulsion. Um, ECLIS is another acronym <laughs> that we heard, Environmental Control and Life Support System. Um, and so you can start to use these products uh, in space. And so this is all off the earth. Uh, in terms of mining raw materials, there are people working on developing concrete using Martian regolith, regolith and lunar regolith. And so maybe you develop landing pads um, in situ so you don't have to take that mass up with you. And then, of course, the big push on the asteroid, the mining asteroid side of things apart from water, is looking at rare metals and bringing them back to the Earth and, and using every cell phone in the room has a little bit of uh, uh, some, rare met some rare Earth metal uh, in it. The other thing that's happening is the idea of commercial stations and habitats, and that can be used for uh, private research. You know, companies can hire out a, a commercial space station to do their own uh, technology development, whether it be low gravity or microgravity research, putting their samples or whatever into a radiation environment to test all those different things. And then, of course, you can use these commercial stations and habitats to prepare for Mars, whether it's a commercial trip to Mars or whether it's a government trip to Mars, uh, like a NASA, a NASA mission or so on. Um, and then the big thing that's been in the news for the last few years, and hopefully in the next year or two, we will see some real progress along those lines. The, the rocketry and, and the, the capsules and so on have been uh, making great progress, but we haven't actually seen the launch of a space tourist other than the mega rich $20 million go, go spend some time on Mir or the space station kind of approach. So that's all kind of changing how we think about space and commercial space. And then there's what I call the three R's, and so there's the in-space maintenance. So again, we're still off Earth, and that includes uh, refuel, repair, and remove. So if you develop these resources from the moon, you can refuel a satellite um, using its fuel for station keeping so it can have a longer lifetime, which of <coughs> course saves the commercial companies money for replacement and so on. Perhaps you can develop the technologies to repair these satellites, and so you can keep their lifetime longer as well and get more use out of them and therefore get a you know, better return on investment. And then one of the issues that constantly comes up, particularly as we think about the number of CubeSats that we're expecting to, to uh, launch in the next few years, is removing uh, defunct satellites or pieces of satellites that have come, come adrift. And so there's this discussion about mitigating the space debris problem. Um, the one graphic, and there's many different versions of this. This is something that um, I've kind of stolen from the United Launch Alliance website. But there's this discussion in, with a number of us in the community talking about what they call the cislunar infrastructure, cislunar marketplace, as ULA is named for it. And I, I don't really have time to dwell on all of this. But the idea is that there's a commercial infrastructure that gets you low Earth orbit, lunar orbit, and the space in between, where you have space tugs constantly ferrying material back and forward from these orbits. You develop um, the training and the technology at the moon to help train future astronauts to go to Mars and so on. You develop the habitat technology, all those different things. The idea is to put it into a kind of commercial framework involving you know, the companies that we're going to hear from later in terms of uh, you know, the transportation and the, and the ability to get material there and to bring it back and on so on and so forth. So there's a lot of things that you can read up of. Everybody knows how to use Google and so we can do that. From the point of view of For the Earth, there's a couple of things I just wanted to, to mention. Some of these were mentioned this morning. Um, there's the idea that, uh, you know, I've said commercial research stations, but in, in principle, the two bullets, the two main bullets here, uh, the first one is sort of in-space development of products that can be brought back to the Earth. And the second bullet is essentially in-space resources that can be used, while they're in space, can be used on the Earth. So in one sense, you could do uh, refined drug development, um, pure drug development in the microgravity environment. We heard about the Zeblan optical fibers that made in space are testing. So those would be space-based manufactured technologies that would be used uh, predominantly on the ground, and so there'd be a market there for that. Um, there's resource development that we may, be, we may need these rare air, so we may even need at some point, we may need fresh water on the Earth. And so you can think about those technologies bringing things back for the Earth. And then there's ideas about energy generation. You know, you just, you, you put these large solar panels in space, generate en free energy from the sun and microwave it back to power, uh, you know, cities or whatever on the earth. As long as you don't miss your target, you ought to be okay there. 
Um, on the other side, there's the Earth remote sensing, and this is a big growth area. This chart, um, I don't know if this is a pointer, this chart I'm showing here is a little bit out of date, but the trend is still the same, and that is, and you probably can't read it from where you are, but the bottom line is, if you, everybody thinks space is expensive and the, and the kind of money that goes into developing rockets and satellites and then the ground systems to support that, but if you actually look at where the market and where the money is, most of it is in what happens downstream, to use a Houston energy term, and that is that, that most of the money is in the application of these services that all this infrastructure provides. And so one, in a science sense, it's earth remote sensing. And how do you use that earth remote sensing uh, for powering industry? And, and we, all know, we all, most of us probably got here using GPS, that's a very obvious one. But there's a whole range of things that can be done. And this kind of comes into the category of what I call space plus. And so you can think about space plus agriculture, you can monitor uh, moisture content in the soil, you can plan your rotation of crops, you can control your harvesters remotely and all these different things, but it all filters into many, many different uh, industries here on the earth that can capitalize on the great resources that we have already in space and the resources to come, whether it be high resolution imaging, whether it be hyperspectral imaging, whether it's LIDAR or radar, uh, GPS, um, timing signatures, all those different things kind of come into this, and this is where the conversation <coughs> is going on the application side, and, and what I find exciting about this is that almost anybody can become a space person. Some kid in college who has a great idea for an app, you know, how many cars are in the supermarket or how many people are going to a sp Glastonbury or something, they can actually start utilizing space data without having the expertise and the finances to fly a space mission and understand that data. So all that's sort of coming together in the Space Plus type picture. Um, and then the thing, in order to support this infrastructure and in order to um, make it viable and to integrate it into what we're doing already, you need a bunch of resources on the Earth. So we've, we've got the off the Earth resources, applying it for the Earth, but we also need resources on the Earth. And this is a, a picture of the Houston spaceport. And so I want to take a kind of Texas theme here um, although this would apply uh, nationally and internationally, if, if you think about it, and we heard a lot about the questions that were being asked of the first panel by the moderator, sort of, what does this do for Texas? How could Texas benefit from this? How could Texas in, uh, in, uh, get involved in this? And if, for those of you who work with NASA a lot, you know you have to, first thing you have to do is come up with a good acronym. And so I think Space Web is a pretty good acronym, and I'm not gonna go through it, but the key point I would like to make is that the space part <coughs> is what we do already develop technologies, do research, think about the science, we educate the next generation, we think about technology and innovation. But you can't really have a successful infrastructure in space and space resources without the web part. You have to integrate the science and technology development with workforce development and economic growth and business development. And that's the kind of message that we have to give to our legislators and so on, who they see, will then see the value of the kind of things we do. So, so this kind of picture, you can think of the spaceport. So Houston spaceport was the 10th commercial spaceport in the United States. I think there's another five or six in waiting being uh, analyzed by the FAA. And you can think of a spaceport as being a launch facility. For most of you who live in Houston, you probably don't want a rocket to be launched from LAP Field because you're sort of in the way. Um, so you have to think a bit more broadly of what a spaceport is. Maybe there's horizontal launch capability that can be used from Houston spaceport. But more, it's more like a, it's, I would like to envisage it more as a gateway or a hub. It's where you do a bunch of space resources. And I think in Texas, and particularly in Houston, but Texas generally, we have all of that there. You can look at some of those bubbles around the Houston spaceport, there's NASA, huge resource for, for Texas and, and, and the, the Houston area. We have the medical center, this was touched on today. The technologies that overlap all these areas can be fed in, whether it's human space flight or materials for, uh, uh, hypersonic flight, all these different technologies. We have the energy industry. Uh, we heard uh, SWRI talk about their deep space, deep, uh, deep ocean. Very much uh, many overlapping technologies, places that humans find it difficult to go without support. Um, and so there's overlap there. Um, and then you can think about the, the power of the research universities in here, uh, the designing of the new, new kind of uh, concepts and in, in from the engineering, the space solutions is the, uh, is the, uh, the data aspect to all of this. And you can start to put all of this together and you start reaching out to the other, maybe in the next four years we may have five spaceports uh, in Texas alone 
Uh, SpaceX has their Brown, Brownsville one. Um, Midland already has one. Blue Origin has their launch uh, and testing facilities. There's some talk in Waco. How do we integrate that infrastructure? And then we can reach out to the other spaceports. We recently created the Global Spaceport Alliance, where we bring the leaders of the commercial spaceports in the United States together, as, long, as well as some international uh, uh, participants as well. And in fact, Arturo Machuca, who runs the Houston spaceport, and I are heading out to the UK in a couple of weeks to talk about their spaceport development as the, the UK space agency is pushing that. So I think that's where we can go. And what we really need to do is just bring those pieces together. And I think that involves a whole range of things from, and again, these are, these are words that are commonly used. What we haven't had is the, the, the kind of leadership, if you like, or the, the, the people coming together to make it actually happen. Private-public partnerships, research and development, technology innovation, and then the, the commercialization part of that. And I think we can do a lot of that in Texas, but you could turn that into a map of the United States, make the same argument. You could actually turn it into a map of the world and, and make the same arguments there. So, so just, I just wanted the, to leave you with this thought about how Texas can get involved here. And, and with the notion that, that space is actually changing in, in a sense from what we're used to, particularly in Houston, right? Buzz Aldrin was here earlier, I don't know if you saw. We're used to astronauts and we're used to these big things. But space is changing where space is becoming less of a destination and more of a resource. And it's a resource I think that we can all tap into for science, technology, and uh, obviously, uh, uh, commercialization. So thank you for your time, and I don't know if we're taking questions right off the bat or wait until later, but thank you. Okay, good. Okay. So, so we have time for a question. Do you have any questions or? Have you seen that? Oh, there's, one, there's one here. Behind the okay, way. please. So, so um, I'm interested, you know, people often talk about uh, drug development as a use in space, but uh, uh, Spark Therapeutics just got approval for Luxturna to treat retinal pigment blindness for $850,000. That's what it's going to cost to treat one patient. So, so uh, this is an uh, exponentially increasing problem in medical drug development and utilization. And if it costs that much to get a special drug on Earth, what's your, how do you envision being able to actually develop a drug in space and provide it in a cost-effective way on the ground? So, so that would have been a really great question for Julie Robinson. <laughs> um, I'm an astrophysicist. But I think, I, so I, I don't know really the answer in terms, I don't know really what it costs, I don't know what the gains <coughs> are, because I know that obviously you can't do all the clinical trials in a, in a sense, all you can do is maybe do the drug development, and still do, you still have to do the expensive clinical trials here on the ground. Um, but I think the idea that it costs a lot to go and get into space is also changing. So, so the notion that you have to build your own $100 million launcher and you have to have all these things. With CASIS, and I'm looking at, at Greg Johnson there, there's, there's various avenues that, that, that folks who are working with Johnson Space Center, in particular for the space station, are making it easier to get into the space environment so that that cost is kind of taken as, as part of NASA and CASIS' mission. I don't want to speak for them that they'll just hand you a few million dollars, but there is an avenue that gets you into space if you want to get there where you don't have to uh, bring up all the, all, uh, the upfront costs. Ultimately, whether it's $850,000 per person or $8 million, I don't know the answer to that. But I think you have to ask those questions of the right people with the mindset that it is feasible and actually tractable as opposed to, oh yeah, it's, it's way out beyond our means. And I think there's people in the room who can help you uh, give you detailed answers to that question. Well, thank you. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. Thank you.